Paradoxes are often thought of as thought experiments, logical conundrums often involving unproven scientific concepts like time travel that challenge our ability to reason through impossible situations. One thing they often lack, however, is practical application. Sure, it might be fun to contemplate what would happen if you travel back in time and killed your father before you were born, or whether the statement, this is a lie, could ever be considered either true or false. But as fascinating as they may be, these sorts of paradoxes rarely lead to major innovations. So today, instead of thought experiments, we're going to be looking at three paradoxical outcomes of empirical research. These are paradoxes rooted in modern science, some of which could lead to significant advancements in modern medicine if we're able to find solutions. Cancer has plagued humanity for as long as we've been humans, and scientists have spent centuries studying how it works and how we might combat it. The first environmental carcinogens were identified 250 years ago, and there has been extensive research since then. However, a paradox related to cancer remained unnoticed until Richard Pato observed it in 1977. Throughout an animal's lifetime, cells are constantly replicating. We all begin as a single cell in utero, which divides repeatedly to form the entire organism. An adult human has about 37 trillion cells, and these cells continually divide to replace themselves. While the rate of cell division varies depending on cell type, on average, human cells divide about once every 24 hours. Each time a cell replicates, there's a chance of genetic mutations. These happen constantly, and most are harmless. However, some mutations can cause a cell to replicate uncontrollably, leading to cancer. Fortunately, our bodies have built-in defenses against this. There's a tumor-suppressing gene called P53 that triggers mechanisms within the cell to repair damaged DNA. If the damage is too extensive, P53 will cause the cell to self-destruct, a process known as apoptosis. The immune system can also recognize and kill cancerous cells. In fact, people develop cancerous cells regularly, but our bodies usually eliminate them before they become a problem. Just before we continue, big shout out to today's sponsor, Sheath Look. I never thought I'd be talking about underwear on the internet, but here we are. And honestly, if there was a pair of underwear that I would talk about, it would be the fantastic underwear that is sheath. It is simply that good. They have a dual pouch design. It's not just a gimmick. It uh, is very comfortable. It keeps everything in the right place. In summer, it keeps you from being like, all sweaty and swampy down there, which is very nice. Look, all your different man parts go in the different sections. Just keeps everything super organized, engineered for your anatomy is how they put it. No more awkward adjustments, no more discomfort, just breathable, friction-free support that keeps everything where it should be. And it's not just underwear. Sheath also make winter base layers that are perfect for workouts, hikes, or just surviving the cold months. Working out, I wear these all the time, especially for workouts. They're just like, you know, when you're in the gym, you don't, you don't, you don't want the movement that you get with boxes or the, the tightness that you get with briefs. And that's why Sheath is so perfect. Right now, you can get 20% off by going to sheath.com slash side projects and using the code side projects at checkout. That's sheath.com slash side projects. Your future self will thank you. And now back to today's video. For a tumor to form, a cancerous cell must accumulate several specific mutations simultaneously. One that causes uncontrolled reproduction, one that disables the P53 gene, and one that hides its presence from the immune system. The odds of all three of these mutations occurring in a single cell are low, but over a person's lifetime, their body produces between 10 quadrillion and 100 quadrillion cells. Even though the chance of any individual cell forming a dangerous tumor is low, the sheer number of cells results in about 20% of people developing cancer at some point point in their lives. However, what Pato noticed in 1977 was that humans didn't seem to be getting nearly as much cancer as expected. Across the animal kingdom, cells are roughly the same size. Larger animals don't have significantly larger cells, they just have more of them. Pato observed that even though humans have a thousand times the mass of mice and live 30 times as long, meaning we have a thousand times more cells dividing over a longer period, both species develop cancer at the same rate. Logically, this didn't make sense. In 1998, a study confirmed the idea that more cells should mean more cancer. Data showed that humans who were taller or heavier than average were more likely to get cancer. The rate of cancer has increased significantly as human life expectancy has increased. The same is true within mouse populations, meaning that the number of cells and longevity are risk factors for cancer within the same species, even though humans weren't getting cancer at thousands of times the rate that mice do as would be expected. 
Later research examined dozens of mammalian species and found no correlation between the number of cells or lifespan of a species and its cancer rates relative to other species. For example, elephants have about 70 times more cells than humans, and blue whales have over 2,000 times more cells, but they don't develop cancer at higher rates than humans. In fact, cancer is extraordinarily rare in both of those species. This observation is known as Pato's paradox. If all cells are equally likely to become cancerous, then mammals with more cells should have more cancer. So, why don't they? Why do giant mammals with many times more cells than humans or mice seem to get cancer at dramatically lower rates than smaller mammals? For the most part, we just don't know. If we did, it probably wouldn't be called a paradox. But there are some theories why this might happen. To start, many larger animals have slower metabolic rates, so their cells don't divide as often. While this introduces a variable that wasn't originally accounted for, human cells don't divide anywhere close to 2,000 times more than blue whale cells, so there's still got to be something else going on. Another theory is that these large animals do get cancer, we just don't notice. The larger an animal, the larger a tumor would need to be for it to become deadly. It's possible that giant animals like blue whales are full of small tumors that would be deadly to a mouse or even to a human, but are just not large enough to affect the whale in any way. Related to the size of tumors is another theory called hypertumors. The idea is that as cancerous cells reproduce, they continue to mutate. Some cells mutate to form a separate tumor that competes for resources with the original tumor so aggressively that it cuts the main tumor off from the vascular system, killing both tumors in the process. Essentially, the tumor gets a tumor. The term hypertumor comes from hyperparasites, which are parasites parasites. It's possible that humans die of cancer before hypertumors have the ability to form, whereas larger mammals like whales require more cancer cells for a tumor to become deadly, giving more time for hypertumors to develop and kill the original tumor. Note that while there is some indirect evidence that this might be possible, there is is no direct evidence of hypertumors anywhere in the animal kingdom. While there have been observations of one tumor outcompeting another nearby tumor in the same person, causing one of the tumors to die, there aren't any documented cases of a hypertumor existing, let alone resulting in the mutual destruction of the tumor and the hypertumor. This theory is largely based on just a single paper from 2007 that used computer simulations to demonstrate the theoretical possibility of hypertumors. Although this is considered a paradox, finding an answer is an important area of research, as discovering how giant mammals avoid cancer could help humans in our own fight against it. And when it comes to elephants, we've even found an answer. We mentioned the P53 tumor suppressor gene earlier on and how it helps prevent cancerous cells from multiplying, requiring that the cells not only mutate to become cancerous, but also disable that gene. Nearly all animals have a single P53 gene, but researchers have discovered that elephants have 20 copies of the gene. Having so many copies provides their cells with incredible redundancy in preventing cancer from spreading, but this particular adaptation seems limited exclusively to elephants. Other large mammals like whales, hippos, rhinoceroses, and so on each only have a single p53 gene, yet they seem equally resistant to cancer. It's possible that there are other genetic adaptations present in these animals that we simply haven't discovered yet. Alternatively, it may not be the other large animals that are outliers. It's possible that humans have an abnormally high rate of cancer stemming from environmental factors and our diets. Exercise is good for you. A mountain of research shows all the ways regular exercise benefits humans. We want to make that clear from the start, as this point often gets lost or confused when discussing the exercise paradox and its implications. That said, exercise may not be as useful as previously thought when it comes to losing weight. We eat food every day and use the calories to power our bodies. If you consume more calories than you use, the excess gets stored as fat for later use. Since physical activity burns calories, conventional wisdom has always been that the two keys to losing weight were to exercise more and eat less. However, new research has shown that this might not actually be the case. The study that really kicked off discussions about the exercise paradox was a 2012 study involving the Hadza tribe of Tanzania. But the results were not an outlier. A number of previous studies had already supported what the researchers found, even if the previous research didn't fully explore the paradox. The 2012 study followed members of the Hadza tribe, a group of hunter-gatherers who routinely walk up to 9 kilometers each day while hunting and foraging. Tribe members were given special water containing rare isotopes of hydrogen and oxygen. By examining the amount of these isotopes in their urine, researchers could calculate the amount of carbon dioxide their bodies were producing each day, and thus the number of calories they were burning. This is called the 
doubly labeled water method, and it's been the standard measure for measuring energy expenditure ever since it was discovered. The data from the Hadza tribe was then compared against sedentary office workers in industrialized nations, and the results were pretty shocking. Hadza men burned around 2,600 calories each day on average, and the women burned around 1,900 calories. This energy expenditure was nearly identical to people who were mostly sedentary, despite the Hadza tribe being far more physically active. It was always assumed that energy expenditure would be additive. It takes a certain amount of energy to keep your body functioning, with the brain using up about 20% of your total daily energy. So if your body needed 2,000 calories just to function, then doing 300 calories worth of exercise should logically burn a total of 2,300 calories for the day. Or so we always thought. However, this research suggests that energy expenditure is actually constrained, that there is essentially a predetermined amount of energy that the body will use each day. If the body isn't using that energy for physical movement, it may instead use it on other internal processes. For example, inflammation is an immune system response to various stimuli. In people who exercise regularly and are using up their daily calorie allotment, the immune system has to be as efficient as possible with processes like inflammation, which require energy. Energy. But as a sedentary person whose body needs to use that excess energy somehow, they may experience higher levels of inflammation or even chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation can have severe negative consequences, so the paradox ironically reveals yet another reason why exercise is good for you. It's best not to have our bodies use excess energy on things like inflammation. It's important to note that while there is a lot of evidence supporting the exercise paradox in sample populations as a whole, each person is different. While total energy expenditure in humans seems to be constrained on average rather than additive, there are clear examples where we know this isn't the case. High-performance athletes like endurance runners or those competing in strongman competitions tend to need several thousand calories each day just to maintain their weight, especially during strenuous training cycles. Even for people who are exercising for health rather than pushing their bodies to the limit, there is significant individual variation in how much this theory holds true, even if the aggregate data supports the idea. When a previously sedentary person begins daily moderate exercise, it seems to provide an initial shock to the system. Even if they don't change what they eat, individuals who start exercising may see weight loss early on until their bodies adapt to the new levels of activity by reducing energy spent on other internal functions to compensate for the extra energy expended from exercise. Even before the exercise paradox was identified, this pattern of early weight loss followed by a frustrating plateau was something that millions of people had experienced. Because the exercise paradox contradicts centuries of conventional wisdom, it's still a new area of research with questions that are yet to be answered. It's quite possible that energy expenditure is neither fully additive nor constrained, but that the reality lies somewhere in the middle. Regardless, based on the best available data, it seems that regulating calorie intake is far more important than exercise when it comes to weight loss. But but again, exercise, still good for you, still important for your health, even if it doesn't appear to directly cause weight loss in the way that we once thought it did. Wouldn't it be great if there were more resources? It certainly sounds beneficial, but it turns out that it could be potentially disastrous. The term paradox of enrichment was coined in 1971 by ecologist Michael Rosenzweig, and it relates to population ecology. We generally see two types of predator-prey relationships. Some are cyclical in nature, where increases in the prey population result in increases in the predator population. The predators then begin to run out of food, their population decreases, allowing the prey population to expand again, and the cycle repeats itself. While these cyclical relationships do exist in nature, they tend to be rare. It's what we might expect from a theoretical predator-prey model, but in the real world, where factors like disease and competition over territory exist, we usually see predator and prey populations reach an equilibrium. So, what if the environment was enriched such that the prey population was able to grow? More importantly, what if resources became so abundant that the prey population was able to grow completely unbounded? That may sound like heaven for the predators, yet the results of laboratory experiments showed very different outcomes. One of the most common examples of the paradox of enrichment comes from two single-celled organisms, Didoninium nasutum, the predator, and Paramecium aurella, the prey. When the two were put into an environment together, the Didoninium would eat the Paramecium and both would go extinct as expected. When a source of food was added for the Paramecium, there was typically some oscillation between the populations, but they would eventually reach equilibrium. 
However, when an effectively infinite supply of food was added to the environment for the paramecium, the species were unable to coexist and it was the predator who went extinct rather than the prey. Essentially, the increased number of prey caused the predator population to balloon to unsustainable levels. This eventually resulted in the predators all dying off as prey were able to hide from and evade the competing predators long enough. Rosenvig described the relationship as a paradox because of the irony that attempting to enrich an ecosystem could instead lead to its instability and even to species extinction. Fortunately, infinite resources don't exist in the real world. While the paradox of enrichment has been demonstrated in labs many times, we don't tend to see this actually occur in nature. There's also a number of factors in nature that can prevent predator populations from growing to unstable levels, such as the difficulty of catching and eating the prey in question, or potential toxicity of the prey that makes eating them less desirable. Real-world factors like these help prevent ecosystems from being thrown into upheaval, even in the presence of an explosion in the prey's population. Of course, it's also quite possible that we could see this paradox destroy a natural ecosystem rather than being limited to laboratory settings. We just haven't seen it happen with the right predator-prey combination yet. 